very proud to present this uh, aspect, this this lecture today, because it uh, reflects the research research methodology that I went through to publish my uh, MA thesis, which has just been submitted to Bar Ilan University. Um, I also want to dedicate the lecture to uh, Amos Kloner, who uh, was with me through many stages and always uh, supported my research, and he would have been happy to be here to see the culmination of my, my subject. So uh, we're going to, the, the, the lecture is going to be presented chronologically according to the history of research, and I might jump back and forth in order to uh, keep it interesting. So we are talking about a site called Beit Natif. Oh, it's moving there and not here. Okay. Uh, which is located in the Jude Judean Shfela, um, sort of forms a triangle between uh, Jerusalem and uh, Hebron to the west. Uh, it is the uh, transitional region between the highlands to the east and the coastland to the west. Um, Beit Natif appears on the PEF uh, maps. Making sure that you're saying what I'm saying. Okay, on the PEF maps along the Roman road leading from Beit Guvrin to the south, uh, southwest to Jerusalem in the north, uh, northeast. Um, the area of Beit Natif for many people is the site of an Ottoman village, uh, or British mandate village, um, but its roots are much uh, deeper. We, it was mentioned twice in the writings of Josephus under its Greek name Bethelophemen uh, as one of the ten toparchiot, the toparchies, the administrative units of the Hasmonean government. It was a major site all, all the way from the Hasmonean dynasty until 1948. Um, when we talk about archives, the, me as a field researcher, or field archaeologist, aerial uh, reconnaissance that was done before uh, the State of Israel during the World War I and World War II periods is uh, an amazing source. Here you see an aerial uh, photo of Beit Natif village. It's highlighted in, in uh, red with the uh, quality of the images, the negatives that have re been rescanned and these archives are accessed, are easily accessible through the Hebrew University Library. Um, we can actually blow them up and map out the village as it was pre-1948. Now, in my research, uh, another archive that I got to was the uh, Palmach Brigade, who uh, during 1948 uh, entered the village. The picture you see on the right is the Palmach soldiers entering the village remains of Beit Latif, which between the period of 1948 and 1952 uh, served as a training ground for the army and many of the houses were eventually blown up and eradicated. Beit Natif became what is now known as Khurvat Beit Natif, a, ru a rubble of stones, remnants of the Arab village that existed. Now, during the British Mandate period, there were a number of excavations that were done. Earlier uh, archaeological research in the area mostly focused on Iron Age. Uh, we have Tal uh, uh, Zakaria uh, and um, the main uh, tells uh, Tel Gezer, Tel Lachish, these were the main focus of uh, biblical archaeologists pre the Mandate period, and Beit Natif, as a living village, had troubles uh, to be archaeologically uh, inspected. In 1933, there was an excavation conducted by Dmitri Baramki, who was uh, then serving as the uh, Judean uh, uh, inspector for the Department of Antiquities Palestine, he excavated two cisterns, which were interconnected. Um, uh, has, they have stairways and shafts going into them. He published it in the uh, quarterly for the Department of Antiquities Palestine in 1935, uh, two years after the excavation. Uh, inside the cisterns, went the wrong way, inside the cisterns uh, there were a number of terracotta lamps and uh, figurines. Uh, these are the images that were published in the original Baramki publication. Um, I do want to call attention to the flat discus lamps, um, sort of in the middle frame, the middle uh, image. Uh, we'll get back to those 
these, these lamps are dated to the late Roman period between the third and fourth centuries. Um, and I, and I think they even uh, trickle into the early fifth century as well. Now, uh, when looking at it, and uh, I'm going to try to stick to the archival research, but I have to give some archaeological background. Uh, most of the study of the Beit Natif material has focused on the iconography, these sort of uh, uh, nude busts of women, <coughs> horse riders, uh, they appear on the lamps, you have gladiators, you have masks, all uh, seem to uh, resonate with pagan cultures. Uh, a number of articles have been uh, written on the subject of sort of the paganization uh, of Palestine uh, during the post-Bar Kokhva revolt, after the uh, Jewish administration had failed and the, the rebellion had, had failed. Uh, the settlement vacuum caused the Roman administration to seek out uh, settlers to vacate uh, the, the hinterland. Uh, we can see it in the artwork, these, these figurines and the lamps have parallels in uh, Syria where we think that uh, part of the Roman administration was to bring pagans from uh, the area of Dura Europus uh, and northward uh, to settle the area. Of course, veterans and whatnot would have settled. Now, we'll get to the archi uh, archival research. Sylvia is not here, and again, I'll show pretty much the same slide that was shown earlier today. The uh, Antiquities Authority, or uh, with uh, funding, has made available the, a um, British mandate scientific archives. And going through the archives, there we had mentioned there is the scientific archives and the sort of bureaucratic archives. I'm going to sh now highlight a few things that we only can know about when studying the bureaucratic archives. Me, as an employee of the IAA, uh, the bureaucracy that it takes to lead to an excavation is a lot. There's an excavation, there's, a, there's an inspection report, there are pictures that are done, they're sent to some uh, head archaeologist who makes an official uh, uh, request for an excavation, it's granted, and all this gets internally kept in-house. And in fact, the British, uh, during the, the British uh, Department of Antiquities did the same thing. And we can learn about the background of the discovery of the Beit Natif lamps as seen through the archives. The first letter contained in the archives is from October 1933. Uh, it's a formal request from a villager named uh, Muhsen Abu Ayash. It was translated, all the uh, uh, Arabic uh, telegrams which were sent or handwritten letters. Hmm? Uh, but it's Ayash. It, the, it was a translated error. You'll see in the next letters he's written as uh, Abu Ayash. Um, uh, so the original letter was translated into English. I'm not a fluent Ar Arabic speaker, so I can't read it, but we... It's I, one dot. It's one dot. It's one dot difference. Yes. <laughs> so it was mistranslated in here, and so you have a formal request from the landowner. I beg to state that in my land I have a, uh, in Beit Natif, an old well which I desire uh, to clean and prepare for the winter. Um, Following this letter, we have on the 22nd of October, the Mukhtar of Beit, of Beit Natif writes that uh, we know of this well, and it's lo located in the north of Beit, Beit Natif village. Um, <coughs> and it, it was open before, and he had already found uh, antiquities inside. He writes, uh, a certain time ago he started to work on this well. We know that he found lots of antiquities. So uh, Baramki later writes in a field note that he was asked in 1929 to stop digging this well. Um, following reports, uh, we have... Uh, can, you, can you guys read it? Um, we have uh, a formal report to uh, inspect the cistern by Dmitry Baramki. He gets to Beit Natif and he reports that I've inspected the well and it, it contains many lamps and zeomorphic vases. Now what's, mo what's most important is the tanaim, the, the, uh, the terms of the agreement and to cleaning the well. I can't read it from here, so I will stand up. Uh, basically, uh, that the work is to be done under the inspection of a, a member of the uh, Department of Antiquities. The work is to be done at the expense of the landowner and that the government 
and the landowner have a 50-50 uh, agreement that they'll share the antiquities. Later, we see that Muhsena uh, Ruayash, oh, I went the wrong, wrong, wrong way, sorry, uh, that the digging of the well had started, and uh, that they were ready to, to pay, and, and work commenced. In 1933, uh, another letter was written uh, that the appliant uh, says that he's too, he's too poor to pay for the, the work, and he doesn't agree to the terms. Later, agreement is, uh, another request is sent to the Department of Antiquities, and that they are willing to do it. They got enough family members to do the work. They're going to clean the cisterns. Work was started in late October, and after three days, the workers complained that they don't have enough money, they don't want to, they don't want to continue. However, Dmitry Baramki writes this letter saying that I'm interested in continuing, there's a lot of interesting finds coming up, and convinces uh, the Department of Antiquities to continue funding the excavations. Now, I mentioned that there was a, these flat discus lamps. Here's a, uh, a picture of one of the flat discus lamps uh, that's included in the publication of uh, the ancient lamps of the Schlesinger collection, which is now housed in, in the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew University ceramics collection. Uh, it was published in Kedem number eight. Um, and in the inventory, lamp number 420, also 19 and 21 and 22, are stated that they were acquired in 1936 at the Ohan shop. The Ohan shop was an Armenian antiquities mar uh, store that was located at the Jaffa, mar the Jaffa Gate. Um, many know Ohan shop for its dealings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And here we have from 1931, the inventory, this is just one sheet of the inventory of the Ohan shop that was uh, uh, kept at the British Mandate. And you have an inventory of the, of the items he bought, you have an inventory of where he got them, whether you have the names or just peasant from Hebron and from what area they were, how much he sold them if he sold them. Uh, so apparently in 1936, in the Ohan shop, there were some of this material that has never been found anywhere outside of Beit Natif since maybe a few months ago. Now, uh, included in the publication report in the British Mandate uh, archives, we have item lists. When they excavated in 1933, they didn't have locuses and basket numbers and heights. Every, every new artifact got a serial number. I, they started with one and they ended up here with 600 and something. Um, the material has never really been consulted and Consulting the archives, this is the, a figure of the lamp molds that were uncovered in the, in the cisterns, seven molds uh, in its entirety. But when I visited the Rockefeller collection, there were 33. So uh, we all do this, we all excavate, we all have budget problems, we uh, do not publish every single thing that we, and Baramki worked the same way. Uh, all of these molds are now published in my MA thesis, so we can, we can see the light of the day. Um, Professor Achim Lichtenberger saw the same thing. He came uh, three, four years ago on a postdoctoral scholarship to the Hebrew University, who also visited the Rockefeller collections, saw the finds, took the opportunity to publish the complete figurine catalog, which instead of 50 is something about uh, 300 figurine fragments. The same has not been done on, uh, on the lamps. Um, now I'll bring us into the modern day uh, for those who don't know, the area of Ramat Beit Shemesh or Chorvat uh, Beit Natif is undergoing a lot of uh, modern development. The whole area, uh, in shaded red, is slated for development. Now, the IAA policy uh, uh, employs both archaeological survey, salvage excavations, and inspection on the modern construction. And uh, at a site called Chorvat Sumela, uh, just north of Beit Natif, at the edge of now the modern urban sprawl, I was called to excavate uh, a few years ago. And I started to excavate what you see this long wall on the, on the, on the west. Um, I was called to excavate knowing nothing about the site. Um, uh, there was a contractor who 
who injured the, 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 the back wall. As opening uh, the initial squares, I realized that this has already been excavated. I again had to visit the archives and I found out that Judah Dagan had excavated what's shaded in black uh, during the 90s and I tacked on two excavation areas to the north and south uh, and uncovered the remains of an impressive uh, late Roman villa. Now here's the picture of the Judah Dagan excavations in uh, 1997. I have 1998 photos but this is his original documentation uh, found in uh, the Israel, Sci Israel Antiquity Scientific um, uh, archives, which are by law well required for every excavation to hand in an uh, excavation file. The villa uh, was also a lamp workshop. I have uncovered 15 uh, lampstone molds for lamps of the types that were found in Beit Natif. We have a number of figurines and I asked the question to myself, have I found Baramki or did I not find Baramki? Did I find the original cisterns, the villa, the workshop that was associated? Until I found this, art, this letter that was contained in the British man, mandate from 19, the archives in the British mandate from 1937, written by Dimitri Baramki in 1937, a year after he published the original excavation, stating that I found somebody quarrying stones at the, at the site Hurvat el Sumele, which is not a registered historical site yet. He makes no mention of the cisterns or figurines or uh, vessels, meaning he, he knows that this isn't what he excavated two years, three years prior. Um, and I now have made the case and published it uh, in a number that this is a secondary workshop, a parallel workshop. We're talking about what was seen for about 70 years as a single workshop is much more complex. You have competitors uh, who are making pretty much identical products competing on a free market. Encapsulated in uh, Yuda Dagan's uh, uh, excavation folder, there was one square which did not get drawn in any plan. This is the only plan there is, and I can see it was never photographed, but in the top right corner, uh, you can see in Hebrew it says Taboon Locus 141. When I found the material in, in the archive in Beit Shemesh, for all the ex excavated material, 140 lamp fragments were found in this taboon. Uh, in hindsight, I'm claiming that this is a uh, lamp kiln, which was misidentified by the excavators, and I'm still looking for an opportunity to go back to check this. Uh, most recently, due to the modern uh, development, uh, excavations uh, by a few co-workers, Omer Shalev and Moran Balila, who's not listed here, uh, opened uh, quite randomly uh, a few excavation squares near one of these mandatory or Ottoman buildings uh, in sort of the courtyard, uh, standard excavation squares, until one day I got a WhatsApp call, this is how we communicate nowadays, right, uh, with this lamp. I immediately wrote, wow, 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 amazing, I want to see it, you don't know what you found. I'll translate the Hebrew, a Beit Natif lamp in Beit Natif, I'm pretty sure that I'm not the first one to find such a thing. He had found the first flat discus lamp that Baramki excavated 70 years ago. It's the first one of its kind to be uncovered in an archaeological excavation, and sure enough, during the course of excavation, they found this shaft, uh, the excavator, it's we have to tell the story that the excavators went to take a lunch break, the, the, the workers kept on working, the shaft opened up, they pulled out an ammunition box from the, the Israeli army, and when they returned from lunch, they showed the, the director that the, this cistern had opened up, and here is Baramki then and Baramki now. So uh, without uh, archival research, and without the finds being kept for 70 years, the empirical studies, the quantitative studies, and the quality of research uh, could not be a cumulative effect. I think that my research has shown that um, w one workshop alone couldn't build the whole story, and uh, thank you for listening to my journey through the MA.